when we think of the word karma, we usually, usually think about bad things we did in the past. But that's only one kind of karma out of four, because there, there's good karma and bad karma, and there's past karma and present karma. Like right now, we're meditating, we're making good present karma. We have an intention to stay with the breath. We have an intention to get the mind to settle down, to see clearly what's going on. Every activity, every intention in that direction, and everything we do based on that intention is good karma right now. And the reason we practice is to make it more skillful. So we can see very clearly what we're doing, and particularly to, to see what we're doing right now that's contributing to any stress that's weighing down the mind. Because everything we experience is a combination of past and present karma. Past karma, the Buddha says, is like a field. It's got all kinds of different seeds there. And your present karma is what waters different seeds. So things coming in from the past are not totally deterministic. In other words, you can water some seeds and not other seeds. So what you're doing right now is really important. This is the first principle to remember in the teaching on karma, is that what you're doing is important. It can make all the difference in the world, particularly when we look at the issue of what stress is and what pain is. You have pains in the body, which can result from all kinds of things. Karma in this lifetime, karma in last previous lifetimes. But the question of whether that's going to weigh the mind down is an issue of present karma, which means you can look at that right now and change it right now. This is where the teaching on karma is empowering. As you can see how you're relating to the pain, say, in the body, or to emotional pain that you're carrying around. And you realize you can change it. But first you've got to see it in action. That requires that you have a good, solid place to stay. You don't want to just jump in and start analyzing things in terms of what you read in books or heard in Dharma talks. Because you can get things really wrong that way. You have to be able to sit and let things settle down. When they settle down, they begin to separate out on their own. It's like different chemicals that are mixed together. And as long as you're jostling the, the beaker around, they're going to stay mixed. But if you let it sit, they'll separate out according to weight. So let things sit for a bit. Try to get quiet. Get the breath comfortable so you want to be quiet with the breath. And as for any thoughts that are pulling you away, let them go right now. And things will begin to separate out. There'll be the breath and then there'll be the thinking. You want your thoughts to be directed to the breath, but you begin to realize that they're not quite the same thing. As for any thoughts that are not related to the breath, you can let them go. Let them separate out as well. We have this tendency to glue things together. Our thoughts, our sensations in the body all get glued together. And then they become a big sticky mass. <laughs> Just let things sit here for a bit and separate out. And then you begin to see what's going into your experience right now. We've got the breath coming in, going out. And then you've got the mind talking to itself about the breath, or whatever else it's talking about. And there'll be several layers of command here. 
one conversation is going along, and there's another conversation that's actually commenting on whether we want to continue this conversation or not. So any conversation that's related to the breath, stick with it. If it's helping you settle down, if it's helping the breath get more comfortable, stay with that. This is where mindfulness comes in. That should be part of the conversation, to remind you that this is where you want to stay. And then you begin to see that it's not just the breath and the talking about the breath. There are some feelings and perceptions, pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings. You can work with the breath to create more pleasant feelings. If we're in, there's a pleasant feeling, say, in the middle of the chest, try to breathe in a way that keeps that pleasant feeling going all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out, without any breaks in between. Don't let the in and out of the breath disturb the ease and spaciousness and pleasure that comes with that feeling. And as you do this, you begin to see you have some images in your mind about what the breath is doing, how the breath is coming in, how the breath is going out, what you're doing to the breath. The images may be visual images, they may be kinetic, they can take lots of different shapes, lots of different forms. Just notice that, because those are the categories you're going to use in order to take apart any pain that's weighing down the mind. Because one of the first lines of defense against physical pain as you're sitting here is your breath. How is the way you're breathing relating to the pain? Does the pain set up barriers that the breath energy can't go through? Well, try to change your perception. Think of the pain as being permeable. Think of the breath going right through. And John Lee says, if there's a pain in your knee, think of the breath going down and making sure it goes past that pain, through the knee, down, through the ankle, out through the toes. And notice how your focus is affecting the pain. I've found that if there's a pain in the back, it's usually good to focus in front. If there's a pain on the right, focus on the left. In other words, for the, at least for the time being, not only get out of the pain, but also try to see if there's some way that you're relating to where things are in your body. That's actually part of the problem. So you're using the breath, you're using your perceptions, and you're using your inner conversation here to probe and ask questions. To what extent is the pain actually caused by the way you breathe? Sometimes you change the breath and the pain goes away. Other times the pain is still there, which you've got to look at more of the mental elements that are going into it. What are you telling yourself about the pain? Are you complaining about the pain? The pain has every right to be there. After all, it's natural for the body, normal for the body to have pains. If you're looking for a totally pain-free body, you've come to the wrong place, the human realm. And if you're afraid of the pain's lasting on, or if you talk to yourself about how long the pain has been here. That's a conversation you can drop, because reflecting on those things doesn't help anything at all. Why do you have to keep tabs on how long it's been there? How, why do you have to make forecasts about how long it's going to last? You can just be with a sensation right here, right here, and it's a lot less burdensome for the mind. Or you can be worried about the damage the pain is going to do. I have yet to know anybody who has been paralyzed by sitting and meditating for an hour. If you're 
posture isn't straight, straighten it up. In other words, look at whatever conversations are adding a burden to the mind and try to shred them apart. You don't have to stitch them together. Here you are going to all this effort to talk about the pain, and you're making yourself worse. But you can see that the effort that goes into these unskillful inner conversations is not helping anything at all. But it's taking effort. Why do it? If the words come up, you can just shoot them down. Refuse to connect them into coherent sentences. I've told you about that time I was in Thailand when I had to stay at Watasukaram and their roster of monks to give meditation talks. They had about 14 monks all together, and out of them maybe two of them could give really good talks. That means 12 bad Dharma talks in the course of two weeks. So what do you do? You start refusing to listen to the talks. One thing you can do is refuse to connect the words into sentences. We can do the same with your own inner conversation. That's creating pain. Or you can question it. The mind says something about the pain, you say, is that true? Is that true? Just keep at it. After a while, the mind gets frustrated. And then you start going, looking at the mental image you have of the pain. Is the pain the same thing as the body? Is your awareness of the pain the same thing as the pain? Is your awareness the same thing as the body? These are separate things. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha divided things into aggregates, so you can take them apart. What's the perception? What's the feeling? What are the thought fabrications you're building around these things? What's the body in relation to the pain? What is your, your basic awareness in relation to the pain? If you put these things together to add more pain to the mind, okay, that's your present karma right now. It's a choice you're making. You may not think of it, it just seems to be the natural way you've done things. Well, it's the habitual way you've done things, and you can change your habits. What's your perception of the relationship of the pain. What's the pain's intention? Sometimes we actually think of the pain as having an intention trying to harass us. Question that. Or if the pain seems to be one solid mask, ask where is the point where the pain is strongest. Chase it down. You begin to realize it moves around. And then what you've done is you've glued things together in a way that weighs the mind out. So you learn how to separate them apart. Use your awareness, use your questioning as a solvent. And as you become more active in trying to comprehend the pain, as we were saying this afternoon, you become a moving target. The pain is not aimed right at you. And you can probe around, ask questions about the, these various factors that go into turning the physical pain into a mental pain. And that karma of probing is your skillful karma right now. Even if you don't come up with any clear answer, at least you're not a sitting target. And there are answers. Years back I was listening aghast as a Zen teacher was saying how he really liked the Four Noble Truths, because they asked unanswerable questions. What is the cause of pain? Well, there is an answer. It's your ignorance, it's your craving. Where are they? They're happening right here, right now. Can you find them? They're here. They're glomming things together. And we can hear about this teaching and understand it, but you want to see these things in action, which you can do if the mind is still enough. If you find that as you're probing around and things are getting unclear, just stop. Find another spot in the body to focus on, to get away from the pain for a while. Allow the mind to rest. 
then when it has strength again, try analyzing the pain again. This is your present karma. This is the karma that, as the Buddha said, goes beyond karma eventually. But in the meantime, you're creating good karma and you're using it well right here, right now, as you try to understand this problem. Because this is the big problem that weighs the mind down. If the mind can learn how not to burden itself with pains like this, the other problems in the world are not problems at all. They may, some of them may be soluble, some of them may not, but they don't weigh on the mind. And that makes all the difference. You begin to realize you're the one who's been gluing things together and weighing yourself down. Like those people who collect big balls of string. For years and years and years they collect bigger and bigger balls of string. Totally useless. Gets in the way. Where are you going to store a huge ball of string? And if it gets too big, it's going to go through the floor. Or the image they use in Thailand of the, the old woman who carries around a big bale of hay. She knows that someday she's going to need a bale of hay, so she's always got it. And it's weighing her down. This is what the mind is. It just keeps weighing itself down, weighing itself down. And John Lee's images of someone plowing a field, and as the, the dirt falls off the plow, they try to put it in a bag that they carry along as well. You don't get very far that way. And there's, we take the results of our karma and then we use it to weigh ourselves down. And that makes it harder and harder to do skillful karma. So what you've got to learn how to do is be skillful in how you put things together. Because that's your karma right here, right now. And all the Buddha's teachings on the Four Noble Truths, on the aggregates, and particularly the teaching on past and present karma, skillful, unskillful karma, is to help you understand what you're doing so you can do it well. Do it so well that you reach the point that you no longer cause yourself any suffering. There'll be pains in the body, difficult things in life, but they don't weigh the mind down. That's a skill that's really worth developing. 